The most rewarding things you can do in life are often the ones that look like they cannot be done. Those words from Wake Forest College alum and greatest golfer of his generation, Arnold Palmer, perfectly describe this place he once called home. A place that won big, lost big, stumbled and mourned, and, like the champions it bred, did what everyone said couldn't be done. If I look at myself at 20, Wake Forest is where my heart is, because this is where I grew up. And this is where I, I fell in love with an institution. And it is this place that I treasure, as I called it once the country of my heart. And I, I, I still believe that. Wake Forest was a jewel of the American South. When Depression-era filmmaker H. Lee Waters captured these street scenes in 1939, he found a town with shops, pharmacies, boarding houses, approximately two dozen restaurants, two movie theaters, and a pair of department stores. The college was more than 100 years old, and the town was bursting at its seams. No, uh, we were one community. We were one family, really. It was a an ideal uh, environment. Uh, the, the students knew everybody in town. The merchants downtown uh, knew all of the students. We um, cooperated, collaborated, and shared what we had. Downtown, I'd go in and out of the businesses. Everybody downtown, all the owners knew me, and I knew them. So I had to watch what I did because when I got home, if I had done something I shouldn't have done, my parents already knew about it. It was our main thing to go to Edwards Drugstore to get a cone of ice cream. <laughs> we enjoyed that just walking. It was a happy time, and reminders are everywhere. The historic well removed from campus and restored now stands on the museum grounds. The campus arch, once the main pedestrian entrance for students arriving from the train station. Wake Forest Baptist Church, the shop at the corner of North Main Street that has been a store, fraternity house, and ice cream shop. And the South Brick House, made of local clay. This was one of three structures the Baptist State Convention commissioned for the original campus in the mid-1830s, and the only one that remains. Holding the title of most historic is the Calvin Jones House. Dr. Calvin Jones, a noted physician and former mayor of Raleigh who moved from Massachusetts to the Old North State in 1795, was an original founder of the North Carolina Medical Society before purchasing a 600-acre farm in northern Wake County in 1820. The region, known as the Forest of Wake, lent its name to his plantation, Wake Forest. The Calvin Jones House, which also served as doctor's office and post office, was home to Dr. Jones and his family for a dozen years. But by 1832, Dr. Jones wanted to move west. His good friend, John Purefoy, a Baptist minister from nearby Forestville, persuaded the North Carolina Baptist Convention to purchase the farm called Wake Forest and establish a literary school to produce Christian leaders of quality and education. So they became aware of this property owned by Dr. Calvin Jones, which had, I think, several hundred acres attached to it, and a farmhouse and some outbuildings, and they decided that this would be the perfect place to start a college. Within two years, boys as young as 12 could trade manual labor for religious training at the facility known as Wake Forest Manual Labor Institute. Many of the students would have done uh, chores around the college. They would have built fires, they would have chopped wood, they would have done whatever could be done that they might get a few pennies for having done. Under the tutelage of first president Samuel Waite, a New York native, the school unexpectedly soared, admitting larger classes of older students eager to study Greek and Latin, philosophy and the classics. Samuel Waite was a strong leader working to raise funds for the boys' education throughout the institution's early years. By 1837, the school no longer relied on manual labor for tuition. 
its sole focus was education, and it was renamed Wake Forest College. By the turn of the 20th century, the college had established its illustrious schools of law and medicine. Early chemistry classes allowed students to work in the laboratory, and Alan Young founded the town's first academy for African American children, the Normal and Industrial School, teaching music, Latin, and civil government. It was during this time that Dr. Tom Jeffries shaped the college landscape with magnolias, dogwoods, and azaleas within the rock wall he built and which largely remains unchanged. North of campus, the street that once housed so many professors it was called Faculty Avenue was famous by the 1920s as a leg of US-1, the nation's first federal highway. It was wonderful. It really was. It was a very, very small town. We used to skate up and down this avenue out here with roller skates and you didn't hardly ever see a car. Obviously, you went downtown to go to the post office. You went downtown to go to the bank. You went downtown for meals if you weren't in a boarding house. You went downtown to go to Shorty's. You went to Holdings Drug Store, to Hardwick's Drug Store. And wherever you went, you saw people that you came to know. And the people, well, they were all part of Wake Forest. But then, as now, that didn't mean just one thing. Five towns in one is what they called the place. First, of course, was the college. Second, the business district that sprang up along South White Street thanks to the railroad and provided jobs for many residents helping to establish the town's historic African-American community. Wake Forest has been a bit of a genteel community where, you know, they had the wealthy side of town with, with the white folk and so many of the, of, of the folks from our, our side of the tracks uh, worked for, you know, did domestic work and, and uh, worked in the different uh, businesses and so forth. We rode bicycles. We played ball in the streets, uh, in the fields that didn't have houses. The small houses of the Mill Village with their factory, churches, and commissary made up the fourth section of Wake Forest, producing cotton shipped across the southeast. And the fifth part of town, west of Wake Forest proper and made famous by moonshine, was named for an ancient storm and has always been known to locals as the Hurricanes. There were places in town when I grew up that you didn't go, uh, even as a high school kid. Um, if you went to the Hurricanes, you called. You just didn't show up. They could uh, come in and quite uh, frequently tell me and their classmates that they, they weren't in school last week. They had to help the, their father or their uncle with the liquor still. There was a barrier because you were teaching those from the Hurricane. Uh, and you taught the ones from the town, you taught the mill children, but there was wonderfulness in all of them. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. During World War II, the Defense Department moved the Army Finance School to town. Soldiers camped out in barracks on campus, and local girls served in the mess hall while boys went off to fight. There was no bypassing of Wake Forest, so all of the convoys, troop convoys, came right, right through town, and we could stand in our front yard and, and uh, talk to them, wave to them, and. Uh, uh, sometimes go out if they were stopped and, and give them donuts and coffee and things like that. So we were very much wrapped up in uh, World War II and uh, we played Army quite a bit. Here's a, a helmet that my mother uh, got. Uh, this is mine and she got one for all of my playmates. Uh, we played a lot of war in those, uh, those days and kept up with the, uh, with the, the war effort in uh, Europe and uh, in, in Asia. There was patriotism, and we tied in the news with our history lessons. For the first time to fill its classrooms, Wake Forest College allowed co-eds to enroll. 
allowing the school and town to grow into a place where everyone and everything seemed to thrive. Crowding the football games on Groves Field and the basketball matchups in Gore Gymnasium. Once the biggest indoor arena in North Carolina, it packed in so many fans, it was called the Cracker Box. The people here in town and the near and around town, they all wanted to get in. It was a, it was a hectic place. And if you went in there and uh, you weren't for Wake Forest, you didn't let anybody know it. It was, it was magnificent. Uh, all the color you could possibly imagine. And the students, uh, and the lower bleachers were only about uh, uh, three feet away from the out of bounds marker, so you could you could actually reach out and touch the players as they were making an inbounds play. Athletics played an important part in this town's history. Wake Forest defeated North Carolina in 1888 at the first intercollegiate football game played in our state, and in 1891 defeated the future NC State University in the first college baseball game. In 1936, the college joined the Southern Conference, precursor to the Atlantic Coast Conference. Nine years later, under legendary coach P. Head Walker, the football team surged to victory in the first Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida. And Arnold Palmer became the school's first individual national champion when he won the NCAA title in 1949 and 1950. By 1953, Wake Forest College was a charter member of the Atlantic Coast Conference. This little school just seemed to make you play harder, try harder, and the people, the students, you knew most of them, uh, the people that came to the games, every game, you knew them, and you had plenty of reason to try hard here. And after a victory, we would go to the uh, to Wait Hall. It's now Staley Hall, but we'd go to Wait Hall and ring the victory bell. That, that was the college bell that uh, signaled the, the change of classes. But we would ring that bell halfway through the night if we beat Carolina or Duke. But soon it would all come to an end. The family of Winston-Salem tobacco giant R.J. Reynolds wanted an institution as influential as Durham's Duke University, and it made an offer worth millions to Wake Forest College. It took 10 years of preparation, and in May of 1956, the college picked up and moved 100 miles west to a campus of new buildings, generous funding, and unlimited potential. I think Old Gold and Black in an editorial said that it was as if an atomic bomb had been dropped on the town. To us, Wake Forest was the same, the community and the college. We never said town of Wake Forest or Wake Forest College. It was just Wake Forest. It was all just meshed together. It was very sad for one thing. Everybody hated to see the college go. We would have done most anything to have kept the college here. They, they filled all the trucks up and just moved everything to Winston-Salem and we just sat here. And a lot of us just sat there and bawled, and cried, because it was a very sad day. After they left, we had a lot of trouble because a lot of the, all the things that had catered to college students went out of business. We had soda shops and we had pool rooms. We had three pool rooms downtown and two movies. And it just couldn't, it, they couldn't make it. Of the more than 20 eating establishments prospering at the start of the 1950s, only Shorty's hot dogs remained. It seemed the town that lost its college had also lost its identity, and maybe its future. But Wake Forest, the place that made you want to try harder, achieved the impossible. It survived. Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary took over the campus, Factories arrived. Investors bought land for development, building new neighborhoods, schools, stores, and roads. I think it could, could have gone either way. But I think people that lived here uh, love Wake Forest so much that they were determined and uh, they were successful. I think we aim to preserve it because who wants to lose that, that wholesome, honest 
caring community. Nobody does. Huh? So I think we strive every day to hold on to bits and pieces of it just to, because it's Wake Forest. Yeah. More than half a century after saying goodbye to the college that still shares its name, this is the town of Wake Forest, where the college was born, where its history lives, and where you can still find the most rewarding things. And the Lord has blessed Wake Forest. <laughs>